My name is Rolov Barangu. I'm an associate professor at North Carolina State University, and I've had the pleasure to work with CRISPR-Cas systems since about 2002. CRISPR-Cas systems are composed of clustered, regularly interspatial palindromic repeats, CRISPR, together with CRISPR-associated sequences, Cas. And CRISPR-Cas systems form an adaptive immune system that is DNA encoded, present in the large majority of archaea, about 85 to 90 percent, and almost half of bacteria, 44 to 48 percent. Again, those loci are quite peculiar and consist of arrays that can be quite long of DNA repeats that are interspaced by sequences called spacers. Those spacers originate and are captured from foreign invasive DNA nucleic acids. Those Peculiar loci consist of arrays of DNA repeats that are interspersed or spaced by sequences called spacers. Those spacers originate from foreign invasive nucleic acid, typically viruses, bacteriophage for bacteria, or plasmids. And those captured DNA sequences specifically provide a sequence-based template for targeting of invasive elements subsequently, such as viruses, plasmids, but also ancillary DNA that can be either uptaken by transformation, natural acquisition, transduction, or also target self, either the self chromosome or plasmids that are naturally present in the cell. Now, generally speaking, those sequences are quite short. The DNA repeats themselves are typically composed of 30 to 35 nucleotides, and the spacers likewise are relatively short, also typically 30 to 33 base pair long. Now, generally speaking, the CRISPR-Cas adaptive immune system is composed of three general steps for the mechanism of action. The first step, the adaptive step, is the acquisition of novel spacers to build novel immunity. This step generally concerns Cas protein number one, Cas1, and Cas2. And generally speaking, those Cas proteins recognize foreign DNA, target it, and specifically selectively sample a piece of that DNA for integration as a new spacer together with a new repeat at one end called the leader end of the repeat spacer array. Subsequently, this locus composed of repeat spacer arrays is fully transcribed in the expression stage as a full length pre CRISPR RNA transcript, pre CR RNA transcript, which is then subsequently processed and matured into small interfering RNAs that typically contain a single targeting spacer sequence and two partial pieces of a CRISPR repeat. In the last stage, the interference stage, those small interfering nucleic acids combine with Cas proteins to form a ribonuclear protein complex that specifically guides nucleases towards complementary nucleic acids, typically phage, virus, or plasmid. Those small guide sequences provide a template for sequence-specific cleavage, typically double-stranded DNA breaks, of the target, generating interference. Generally speaking, extensive analyses of those loci and their content and sequences of the Cas genes that are present has led to the establishment of three distinct CRISPR-Cas systems, namely type 1, type 2, and type 3. Generally speaking, the same universal steps of acquisition, expression, and interference are highly conserved. Nevertheless, there are specific Cas proteins, called signature proteins, encoded by signature genes that are prototypical of a specific CRISPR-Cas type. In type 1, the signature gene is Cas3. In type 2, the signature gene is Cas9. And in type 3, the signature gene is Cas10. Those various proteins carry out specific idiosyncratic processes in either the transcriptional pattern, transcriptional control, small interfering CRISPR RNA maturation and biogenesis, or interfere. In all three cases, nevertheless, small interfering CRISPR RNAs combined with Cas proteins, Cas3 for type 1, Cas9 for type 2, the complex called Cascade for type 3 as well as type 1, to really drive interference in a sequence based manner, leading to the cleavage of complementary nucleic acid, primarily DNA in type 1 systems, type 2 systems, and occasionally RNA in some type 3 systems. Though CRISPR loci were first identified in the E. coli genome in 1987, 
the CRISPR acronym itself wasn't coined until 2002. And initially, primary focus of studies focusing on CRISPR-Cas systems was for genotyping purposes based on the number and sequence of spacers that are occurring in those loci because iteratively over time, newly acquired spacers provide a unique genetic path that is time-driven, time-based, time-dependent, and allows people to backtrack the genetic events and acquisition events that have occurred for a specific bacterial strain or archaeal strain. In the late 2000s, several milestone studies enlightened us and revealed the fact that those spacers were specifically acquired from foreign genetic elements in a polarized manner and led to the specific interference of homologous DNA and occasionally RNA. And in the last couple of years, a significant amount of work has put us in a situation whereby a lot of those idiosyncratic, peculiar, fantastic molecular machines can be leveraged and exploited for biotechnology purposes. In the summer of 2012, Chinek and Al published a milestone report in science. They developed a RNA-guided new nuclease system based upon CRISPR spacers and ancillary small RNA molecules to specifically guide cleavage towards any sequence of interest in a reprogrammable manner. And since January 2013, there has been an onslaught of new, important, novel, applicable examples of the exploitation of Cas9 guided by small RNAs for genome editing in a variety of eukaryotic cells, including human cells, notably stem cells, bacterial cells, yeast cells, zebrafish, drosophila, and mice. And several reports have shown that this system can be reprogrammed in a multiplex manner to target concurrently multiple different sequences in a very specific manner. It was also recently shown that RNA-guided Cas9 that has been inactivated and is not a nuclease itself can be repurposed to selectively target DNA sequences and be involved in the transcriptional control, either activation or repression of specific DNA sequences in loci. This can also be done in a multiplex manner. Those many milestone studies have dramatically impacted the speed, rate, efficiency, and flexibility with which people can now edit genomes. Not just prokaryotic genomes, but even complex, model, multicellular, medically, biotechnologically relevant organisms that can be used, investigated, and exploited for scientific purposes, ranging from upstream research of diseases all the way to agrochemical applications for manufacturing of biofuels. The recent rate of publications and the current rate of manuscript publications with focus on genome editing of eukaryotes is promising a stellar year for 2013 for CRISPR. And clearly, this field is just getting started. The rate of new knowledge generation has had a dramatic impact on a few things. Obviously, our canonical views of the CRISPR mechanism of action have changed rapidly and extensively in the recent past, and many a CRISPR myths have been debunked. Nevertheless, a few surviving dogma have allowed us to really leverage those systems for sequence-based targeting and reprogramming, and a continued deeper understanding of the molecular underpinnings of the processes will allow many a scientist to really harness the biochemical potential of those fantastic proteins. And as of late, there are several different primary ways and research avenues to explore the interference machinery for various applications. Those applications include still, as of 2013, genotyping for epidemiological purposes or investigating the content and dynamics of host and virus populations, interference for viral or phage resistance, immunization of an organism against invasive foreign genetic elements like plasmids, genome integrity, transcriptional control, and even targeted programmable killing. Last but not least, genome editing applications for targeted editing, templated genome surgery, 
with the multiplexing open up tremendous avenues for medical and biotechnological applications. Notwithstanding the success of 2013, we only think we've seen the tip of the iceberg and only for the future will tell how far we can push this technology in the future. So we have the luxury currently of being at the second international CRISPR conference hosted and organized by the Biochemical Society and there is a buzz that is unprecedented. Clearly this is perfect timing for many scientists to come together, combine their knowledge and then see how we can fully leverage our understanding of the genetics and biochemistry of CRISPR-Cas systems for applications towards genome editing. This is perfect timing.